Art King here I come. Hello, sports fans, sports collectors, and all hobbyists. Welcome to the Car King Sports and Variety Show. I'm your host, the Catman, Brian Cataquit, a.k.a. the Card King. We are live on ABC's KMET 1490AM.com. Your number one spot right here for news and talk on the West Coast. I thank everyone for tuning in this morning. On the program, we welcome in former NFL power running back of the Baltimore Ravens. He's an author, motivator. We welcome to the program Prince Daniels Jr. Prince Brian C., thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, man. I'm happy to be here. Oh, my pleasure. Prince, I want to begin going back to your younger years, pre-teen. You grew up in Texas. Give us a sense on how football came into your life. Man, football came into my life by watching the game. And i uh, never forget, I was with my mom in the room, and we were watching uh, the Houston Oilers play against the Detroit Lions. And I saw Barry Sanders for the first time. And I saw him do a move that was so phenomenal, and he scored a touchdown. And I remember my eyes welled up with tears, and I looked at my mother, and I was just like, I'm going to be in the NFL, Mom. And she looked at me, and she said, I believe you. <laughs> and, and you were also a fan of Walter Payton, right? Ooh, sweetness. Yes, I was, man. I never seen somebody have that much toughness and resilience. And, um, man, Walter Payton was a, a huge influence in my life. And I also read you know, a lot of his books because I, I, I didn't have the mentor or somebody uh, in front of me to tell me the whole process about football. So I had to use my imagination and figure out how to make it to the NFL. Yeah, speaking about your imagination, I want to ask you, while running with the football at the college pro level, uh, did you envision or emulate running with these two athletes, Peyton and Sanders, in mind? Most definitely. Um, Walter Peyton, uh, running for him came early on, like in college, because, you know, I was just trying to establish myself. So you uh, felt the need to run people over. But once I got to the NFL and I realized that everybody in the NFL is stronger and faster, then I need to work on my speed and work on my agility skills like Barry Sanders. So I definitely emulated those two um, great iconic individuals. And you played for Georgia Tech. Uh, You received a scholarship your second year. Uh, Was that the first college of preference? No, not at all. I, I got um, I received a lot of scholarship offers from schools like Purdue, Tulane, um, Stanford, um, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, Colgate, Brown. But um, I, I didn't do well on the standardized test, uh, uh, the ACT, SAT, and I ended up passing it after signing day. So all of those scholarship offers were taken away and Georgia Tech just happened to fall into my lap. So it was a blessing. And um, I, I, I did an unofficial visit uh, and got accepted into Georgia Tech with my grades, which people don't know. And I was a walk on. And, and from there, um, I became, you know, an, an, an athlete, a student athlete. Uh, but it, it took some time. So um, but that wasn't my first choice. I had other schools in mind, but but Georgia Tech just happened to be the choice. Well, as you mentioned, it was a blessing. I mean, you performed re- remarkably well in Georgia Tech under Coach Chan Gailey, who later, uh, you know, was a coordinator for the Miami Dolphins. He was associated with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, what did you learn most from Coach Gailey, both personally and professionally, if anything? Um, I would say I didn't learn too much, but what I will say is that um, Coach Gailey gave me an opportunity. Right, he saw opportunity in me and allowed for me to flourish. Um, when, when there seems like the odds were against me, I was number seven in the depth chart. And one of the the coaches at the time, who was the offensive coordinator, he told me that my chances of playing at Georgia Tech are one in a million, and my chances of playing in the NFL are one in a billion. So um, I was like Jim Carrey off of uh, Dumb and Dumber. He's like, so you're telling me I have a chance? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you left Georgia Tech leaving such a positive mark on the team's history. You were named first team all ACC 2003 after leading the conference with 1,447 rushing yardage for a bowl game. You set records 307 yards uh, several times. Uh, Other memories that stand out, uh, Prince, during that 2003 season? Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, when we played against Florida State, um, that was my first, like, really coming out game. It was the third game of the season. And I just remember in my head, I was a, I was previously a walk-on, so I had the walk-on mentality. 
but I, I, I ask myself over and over again, like, I'm, I'm like, how do I become the starting running back? I am the starting running back. And uh, the night before the Florida State game, I had a dream that I was going to score a touchdown. And the next day I woke up and I scored that touchdown. And at that moment in time, I realized I'm the starting running back at Georgia Tech and I'm here to stay. So I knew at that moment that um, that, that that that, you know, I, I just transitioned from from being from having a walk on mentality to being a starter. And I knew that it was my role. Man, I also want to mention a few other records that you set at Georgia Tech, which is definitely worth noting. Uh, Georgia Tech's fifth all-time rusher. That's that your Georgia Tech's fifth all-time rusher at three thousand three hundred forty-six. Top three single-season rusher of all time for Georgia Tech, one thousand four hundred forty-seven. You're ranked number two single-game rusher of all time at Georgia Tech. 307 yards, as I just mentioned, you did, you performed that uh, several times and you earned first team all conference in 2003. So, uh, you left a tremendous impression on the team's history. Uh, you must be very proud of that Prince. Yes. Um, and I, I, I want to say one accolade that you left out was, um, I was all academic as well. So, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I was definitely proud. You know, I'll, I'll say I was proud because it wasn't something that was planned. Like, I knew that I wanted to play there, but um, it seemed like, you know, when my opportunity presented itself, I, I took advantage of it and I enjoyed myself in the process. Um, so I was very thankful. And so which definitely makes me proud. But, you know, like I, I definitely had a, a lot of help. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not going to take all the credit. Like, my teammates, they did an amazing job, and my family was, was there to, to support me. So uh, it, it took a collective effort, but it's something to definitely be proud of. Yeah, I mean, Georgia Tech being one of the most successful college football programs over a long history, so it's definitely uh, noteworthy. Uh, let's talk about your, your draft year. Uh, drafted by the Ravens, uh, you were the fourth pick, 2006? Yeah, so yeah, I, I was the 132nd pick, uh, okay. fourth round. Yeah. Fourth round, okay. Yep, right. yep, yep. Uh-huh, 2006, yeah. And now, how was your reaction uh, knowing that you accomplished what millions can only dream or wish for? Man, that was a, a surreal moment for me. Uh, just just knowing that I got drafted to the NFL when, when I started off as a walk-on in college, you know, to go to a, a being drafted, um, man, that, that was any the most joyous and elating feeling. Um, and I was I was honored. I was just like, all right. Let's 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 go ahead and go. Let's put the uh, pads on and let's get to work. Um, you know, I, I definitely wanted to be drafted first round. Uh, I felt felt that I had the potential to be drafted in the first round, but I, I was drafted in the fourth round. But in my mind, I took that little uh, the little arc angle off um, from the four, and I, I considered it as a one. So I considered myself being drafted in the first round, but still, I went in the fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I tell you, and the scouting report on Prince Daniel Jr. was you were you were a muscular back. You spot yeah. openings well. Mm -hmm. You're tough between the tackles, and you're an asset as a blocker and receiver. So yeah. my question to you is, who taught you this? Did this come natural to you? Yeah, definitely came natural to me. But um, I had a lot of a lot, a lot of great coaches in high school and in, and in college um, that would just tell me like, "Hey, um, this is how you do things." They taught me the techniques of the game, and I just always had that 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 courage and that confidence to to just put myself uh, where I need to put myself. And um, I, I didn't fear any anyone, no matter the size. I was willing to chop them down or attack them in any way possible. So. Um, yeah, it was, it was something, you know, that, that I already had, but over time I started developing more skills and my game, um, changed and matured as I, um, started going higher and higher in the rankings. We're talking with uh, former football star, Prince Daniels Jr. Uh, Prince, I want to ask you, uh, do you recall competing for the number three running back role behind Jamal Lewis, Mike Anderson? Jamal Lewis, Mike Anderson, Musa Smith, Corey Ross. Um, then we had two fullbacks, Justin Green and Obi Muhaley. I definitely do um, uh, 
can remember competing with with those individuals. Uh, I wouldn't say competing because uh, they 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 definitely elevated uh, my 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 game. Um, so, but yes, I I do re re remember being in a cooperative relationship with with my running back crew. Uh, any animosity, jealousy you recall uh, thinking back competing against uh, you know your your rivals at that time? Uh, no, not at all, man. Because I was I was a new fish in the big pond, and I, I didn't know what I was doing, and so they could recognize that, and they would laugh here and there, and they would just give me some tips and pointers and point me in the right direction and just tell me, you know, it's all right, Rook. You don't have to do too much, man. Um, and so they really helped me understand the game because I, I didn't know much about the game because I had a lot of raw talent. But uh, when, when they started explaining these small things to me, then I started realizing, like, oh, okay, ah, they are helping me become a great player. So there was no, no jealousy, no animosity. It was all a brotherhood and love. Man, so you played three seasons. Uh, it was due to an injury uh, in, in which you had to change careers. Uh, how did that injury happen? How difficult for you was it not playing in the NFL? Uh, take us back to that time in your life. Man, uh, so the injuries, uh, they happened. And thank goodness it wasn't career-ending injuries. But on paper, I was, I was on IR uh, for uh, consecutive years. And... So it looks like I was injury injury prone on paper, but uh, it was a, a, a hamstring injury and a shoulder injury. I tore my labrum um, my last year, and man, that was pretty difficult, you know, because that's what I identify myself as, you know, a, a professional athlete. And so when I wasn't able to perform anymore and contribute to my team. Um, I had a self-identity crisis, and uh, it just led to me having a de experiencing a depression uh, after the game was over. And um, you know, I was battling with a lot of internal, I would say, demons uh, because you know I just felt like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, did not get a chance to accomplish my dream that I set out for myself. Hmm. So now, is that when you started to get into mindfulness meditation? Uh, take take us back to that time because uh, you also started a business. Uh, you have a website. Uh, talk about mindfulness meditation. If that helped you uh, overcome your ba battles with depression, etc. Most definitely, man. It was the one remedy that saved my life. Um, you know, the, the root cause of depression is thinking about something in the past, something that that did not happen, and you wanted to happen, and so you contemplate on it. Um, and in the future, um, the root cause of anxiety is like thinking about something in the future that has not happened. Uh, and so for me, I found meditation to help me stay in the present and not be concerned about the, the past or the future. And yeah, it was something that I had to lean upon after I left the game, because when you have this self-identity crisis, uh, because you've been identified with, with your career for so long, um, you forget who you are. And so I had to remind myself of who I am and, and look within and, and check in and remind myself that I, I was this person before I became a football player. And I'm, and after the game is over, I'm still this person. And so now um, I created a business out of what I do because I realized that there are a lot of athletes that go through a transition phase. And sometimes they, they come out of it up, sometimes they come out of it down. But what the the one thing that they have to come out of it as is themselves, them all their authentic self, and um, I created a business uh, that helps athletes do exactly that, and that's the reason why I wrote my book. And my book is not for athletes per se, because I I feel and I know that we're all athletes in this game of life. Uh, we all have to jump jump over hurdles, run through obstacles. And face the obstacles, you know, we're shooting for a goal, we're, we're trying to score that touchdown. So uh, it's it's applicable and relatable to every single individual uh, because we all have that mindset of being an athlete. And and once we start realizing that, then we will realize that, man, the, the techniques and the tools that I have in my book um, are applicable for every individual in, in every walk of life. 
And, you know, Prince, a, a question that comes to mind, you know, being in the profession that you were in, a professional athlete admired by millions, uh, one of the hardest things I would think is to control that ego, right? Because, um, you know, the ego can get in the way and meditation can definitely assist in uh, reducing being in the ego mind and being more authentic. Would you agree with that? Uh, to a degree. I, I, and, and I would say I, I don't bash the ego because you still need the ego when, when, whenever you're in that professional sport. Why? Because the ego is your protective mechanism. It, it, it protects you. You know, when someone says that you're not able to do it or the fans are heckling you or your coach is telling you, hey, man, you need to get your stuff together. Uh, um, the ego plays a part. And it allows for you to um, uh, to be able to uh, push back, right, and and be the resilient individual that you are, and prove to people what you're capable of. Uh, so you need the ego, but what the meditation does, it allows for you to pull the ego out, like compartmentalize the ego, pull it out when you need to pull it out, but also be at peace and calmness with what you're doing, and be centered. And that's what I teach because uh, in my book. I talk about mastering the balance between your power and your peace. And so your ego is your power and your peace is your practice of meditation. And when you can learn how to use these things and, and sort of like the, the yin and the yang, the ebb and the flow, the problem and the solution, then you start realizing you're in a rhythm, you're in a flow, and it allows for you to get into the zone. And once you get into the zone, you operate at such an optimal level that it's hard for anyone to stop you. Now, there's so many different types of meditation. There's body scan, reflection, vis vis visualization, focus, awareness with the breath, loving kindness, etc. Which do you prefer? Uh, which type of meditation do you prefer? Do you teach? Um, so um, I, I guide meditation, and the, 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 I'll just give you three that I. I help individuals focus on whenever they first start practicing meditation. And those three are, um, one, the observation, observation of the self, observation of your thoughts, just being able to sit and just watch your thoughts and not allow your emotions to cling to those thoughts. Meaning for just for a quick example, you see a dog that's tied to a leash and every every single car that runs by, they're like, right? And so they exhaust all their energy because they're clinging to every single thought or every single car that they see running by. And so um, what I teach people is just learn how to sit still and, and not be that dog, but just observe the things that, that are passing, like your thoughts. Uh, another one... Um, uh, focusing on your on your breath, your breathing, the the natural inhales and exhales. When you learn how to do that, then your mind is not fixated and focused on all the other problems that you have going on in your mind, and it just allows for you to slow slow things down and focus on breathing. And then the third thing is um, just going into your your practice with an initial thought. And if your mind veers off from that initial thought, bring it right back to that initial thought and keep doing that over and over again until you are able to focus on that one thought for an extended period of time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing stuff. Uh, talk about your current projects and, and mention the website again and where the audience can purchase your book and, and all of that. Yeah, so um, you can go, you can check out more about me at my website, www.princedanielsjr.com. Um, my book is located on Amazon.com. Go and check it out. Go and read it. It's called Mindfulness for the Ultimate Athlete, Mastering the Balance Between Power and Peace. And as I mentioned, it's applicable to everybody because we're all athletes in this game of life. Um, and also, you know, after you read it, leave a review. Um, I would love that. And one of the things that I have going on is my master, my six-week master class called uh, Unlocking Your Peak Performance. It's based upon my book, and I teach you how to get out of your own way and unlock your full potential and, and live into that full potential, uh, which, and it begins next week, the 18th of February. Um, um, that's a Thursday, and it starts at 8.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to 9.30 p.m., and it's a... It's a live engagement. It's not pre-recorded. I'm there live. I do it. I'm, I'm there every week, and I'm giving you all the tools that you need to unlock your peak performance and live to your most optimal level. 
you know, just be the best version of, of yourself that you can be. And it's okay if you if you end up missing it because it will be recorded. So that way you can go back and look at the videos and catch up. It's great stuff. And, and you can also purchase the book on Amazon, right? Because I'm looking at Correct. Amazon and I yes. see. Yep. And uh, so what so what else have you been doing during this crisis of COVID? Uh, well, what, what's been going on in your life? Um, um, me, I've just been reading books, just cultivating my energy. So reading books, working out and, and, and practicing mindfulness and meditation and, and, and this course and just teaching individuals that um, don't let what's going on right now. Or what, when I say individuals, I mean professionals and the high achievers and top one percenters. Don't let what's going on right now affect what you're doing. You know, learn how to adapt. That's what our our genes do, our cells do, is adaptation. So they learn how to adapt. So when you can learn how to do the exact same thing, you, you, you won't be in a depressed mode and you won't be full of anxiety. You'll be in the present and you'll realize that the present is a gift for you. And so I've been helping people get out of their own funk, get out of their own way during this time. So it's been really good for my business. Yeah. And uh, just a couple of couple more questions of any other methods that you can recommend uh for like uh, depression how about like people that overeat or people that have social anxiety these are all methods that you can use to help battle all these type of ailments yes um so i start off with people that have anxiety when it comes to anxiety you have to remember the root of anxiety is thinking about something in the future that has not happened we create these these uh figment of my imaginations or, or these scenarios that have not happened. And so what you have to learn how to do is become present with your breath, right? You, you have this anxiety, you have, you can feel your nerves, like eat very erratic. So you, you calm yourself down with a, a nice, simple breath exercise, nice inhale and a nice uh, calming exhale. And you make sure that your exhale is longer than your inhale. So you, if you inhale, you inhale for about three seconds. And when you exhale, you exhale for about five seconds. And what this does, it sends a signal to the brain that you're calm. So when it comes to people that overeat, they probably overeat based upon their nerves or based upon some guilt or depression. And so um, drinking more water allows for you to stop eating so much. Uh, and, and, and you need to drink more water. Drink water in the morning time when you first wake up. Drink water before you go to bed and, and all the times in between the day. And, and, and the things that help you do that is by carrying um, some type of water container with you. Uh, I, I say try to stay away from plastic bottles as much as possible. Um, use a glass bottle. Uh, one, it keeps you it keeps you conscious, and two, um, the water is 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 a little bit more more purified and alive. Uh, and also, just be like whenever you practice meditation, you start becoming mindful of of who you are and what you are, and you stop eating so much. You start you stop eating your problems, and you start solving your problems, and that's what helps with someone that's an overeater. You know, just being able to just sit and be still and be like, okay, what, what what do I want out of life? Where am I in my life? You know, am I grateful for what I have? If I'm not grateful, then I need to figure out what a, what I am grateful for, and I, that's my starting point. And then from there, you if you have goals and dreams, you start accomplishing those goals and those dreams based upon the foundation that you just created with yourself through through your gratitude. And how about for the people listening that may have social anxiety? It works the same way. It works the exact same way. Social anxiety, man. Um, you know, public speaking is the one thing that you fear. But the thing about public speaking, what you fear about public speaking is the very is, is the first few seconds before you actually start speaking. It's like, oh, it, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. Uh, and so you either freeze or you just allow yourself to ease into it. And so... Um, you, and, and the way that you do that is by calming your nerves, breathing, deeper breaths. Like sometimes if if the, the inhaling for three seconds is not long enough, inhale for six seconds and then exhale for eight seconds. You know, uh, and this, this breath exercise allows for your nerves to calm down. Again, whenever you exhale 
and you do a long exhale, it's sending a signal to your brain that you're calm. In the same way, whenever we automatically, our bodies automatically yawn, right? If you ever think about it, when we yawn, it's right. a long exhale, like, oh, like nice inhale. <gasps> oh, and now your body knows it's time to transition to sleep. So um, just the same thing with people that have social anxiety, just be mindful of that. Be mindful of where you are. And if you if you do, you know, have experienced anxiety during, during the social times, um, uh, you can always just say, hey, I have to go to the restroom real quick. Excuse me. You know, I apologize. I've been trying to hold this for so long and, and then regroup and come back and, 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 and deliver whatever that you want to deliver. So, yeah, and, and, you know, and I heard that there's little tactics that one can do, like tapping yourself on the chin, tapping yourself on the head to put you in the present moment. I don't know if you heard any, anything about that. Most definitely. I've, I've heard about that. And it, it's just bringing you back to the present moment, making you become aware of what you're doing. Because um, like whenever you tap or somebody hits you, it, it takes you out of your, 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 your space of being focused. So those are definitely like some good techniques that you can start off with. But, you know, it's always checking in with yourself. First thing in the morning when you wake up, you know, just sit down and spend some time with yourself because then that, that will start your day off with heightening your level of awareness. Man, fantastic information. I'm, I'm jotting all this down. I really appreciate it. The website is princedanielsjr.com. Unlock your potential by unlocking your mind. Prince, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for the lesson. You're welcome, Brian. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. You too. That was uh, star football running back, Prince Daniels Jr. Again, the website is princedanielsjr.com. There you can purchase his book and read about his biography. Thanks so much, Prince. Until next week, happy collecting to all.